going to be the first of our press briefings from Genesee County. My name is Rochelle Stein. I currently serve as the chair of the Genesee County the, Legislature. Um, we're working very hard to gain knowledge regarding the very fast evolving activities around COVID-19 pandemic. And here to address you today are our professionals in our county. We have Tim Yeager, who is our Genesee County Emergency Management Officer. We have Paul Banker, who is the Orleans County Emergency Management Officer. We have Paul Pettit, our pub shared public health director. <laughs> Behind me, Dr. Martin Moore from the city of Batavia. Our county clerk, Michael Cianfrini. Our sheriff, William Sharon. And our county manager, Jay Gazelle. I would ask you to please give these professionals your full and undivided attention, and I appreciate that. Thanks. All right, well, good afternoon, everybody. I would like to uh, thank you all for being here today. Um, thank you, Madam Chairman, for that introduction and uh, my uh, colleagues around the uh, podium up here with me today. I first want to say that this um, is an unprecedented uh, event, and that's why we're here talking to you. Um, we, we have been uh, responding and looking at this uh, uh, issue as it's been evolving right since uh, back around the end of last year, and it's something that we have been following locally, we have been preparing for, we have been working hand in hand with my colleagues around here and those that are not here. Uh, my public health staff have been working around the clock the last couple weeks, specifically when we started to see cases here in New York State. Um, I want to make sure that they're recognized for the hard work that they're doing to protect our residents, to make sure that you guys are safe and to make sure that you have the most accurate local factual information that we can provide. Um, our goal here today is to address you as our residents and to make sure that you, again, have that information you need to make sound, wise choices to protect yourselves and to protect our communities. Uh, this situation is rapidly evolving, I will say by the minute, it seems like. Uh, every time we turn on the TV, there's another press conference, there's another directive and mandate coming out of Albany, and we are doing our best to be uh, timely and reactionary to that and coming up with plans and how we're going to meet these new mandates. It is very difficult and challenging, uh, but again, with the, uh, the brain power around this room and those folks that are in our communities working, that have been planning and drilling and working on preparedness to these type of events, uh, we are well, well handled and well situated to weather this storm together. So um, I'm gonna go through a brief situational update, I believe that has been provided to many of you. And uh, we're gonna talk through that a little bit to give you guys an idea of what's been going on locally in our communities. And then we'll uh, open it up to some questions uh, from the press here. If they have specific uh, additional needs and different questions they wanna ask, we're happy to uh, answer those again by the uh, appropriate person up here. So, as I said, this is situationally uh, rapidly and changing. Uh, what you have in your hands is outdated. You just printed them about uh, 10 minutes right. ago. All right, <clears throat> so I wanna first and foremost say we do not and I will repeat, we do not have any confirmed cases in Genesee or Orleans County. There is a lot of rumors flowing around. There is a lot of information that is out there on Facebook and social media and other streams that is to the contrary of that. Trust me, we are getting the calls, we are getting the concerns, and I wanna make sure that everybody is aware that our department is going to be getting any calls immediately from the state lab. The private labs will call the state lab we will get notified of any positive confirmed COVID-19 cases in our counties. When that happens, you will know about that. Uh, you can go to our website. You can look and see what the current updates are. We are updating that daily uh, in, the, in the late afternoon, evening with whatever the precautionary quarantines are, the mandatory quarantines, or the mandatory isolations. And we'll talk a little bit more about those. But again, go to our website and look and see those, that is where you will find that accurate information. If you're hearing it on Facebook, if you're seeing it out and about in the community, that is not from us, that is not the case. So we just wanna make sure to try to quell some of those uh, rumors that are going on out there. Stick to our information, we're providing that as real time as we can to help keep you informed and safe. All right, so uh, again, what you have on your sheet is now dated. Currently there are seven people in Genesee County that are under precautionary quarantine. All right, there are three people in Orleans County that are under mandatory quarantine. 
And again, we'll talk about a little bit of the differences there. Um, you know, the quarantine approach is really to separate folks. Again, we want to keep them uh, apart from one another. It's restricting movement. So when we're talking about precautionary, these are folks that uh, may have come back from a, an area, again, internationally, uh, especially leading up to the last week or so, where there's widespread community spread of COVID-19. So we want to monitor those folks. We want to make sure that uh, they're home, they're following through that 14-day incubation period and not becoming symptomatic uh, during that time. Then there's the, there's the mandatory quarantine, and these again are well folks, but these are folks that have been exposed to a confirmed case of COVID-19. They're at a higher risk of potential uh, COVID-19 illness and becoming symptomatic, so those are mandated quarantines. In isolation, just to, to clarify, is those that are, are ill or in are symptomatic. So those are folks that are actually uh, showing symptoms and have tested positive from COVID-19, and those folks are under mandatory isolation. So there's three different levels of uh, approaches that we're taking when it comes to dealing with our folks um, uh, depending on their exposure and their symptomology. Um, one thing to note is our testing capabilities are currently limited. Uh, again, there's been some uh, differing stories from the federal level down to the state on the availability of uh, swabbing kits. And uh, the reality is here, I can tell you right now in our, our county health departments, we have zero. Um, we are currently working uh, very quickly uh, through emergency management, through the health systems to get more swabbing kits. Uh, but at the moment, it is very limited in our communities. Uh, obviously, there was an announcement made uh, a week or so ago now that our community providers and health systems can start uh, doing their own swabbing. And our understanding is that is starting to occur. There is um, uh, swabbing kits that, is out, that are out in the community, and they are beginning to do that. Uh, but from the health department side, we are very limited and we are working hard to get more kits. And we'll talk a little bit more about the uh, community uh, drive through swabbing sites in a little bit. A uh, little background again, both counties have declared an official state of emergency. Uh, that happened on Saturday, went into effect uh, midnight Sunday morning. Uh, and that was done uh, again through a lot of consultation and a lot of discussion with uh, our county managers and our uh, county executives around the need to do that. Uh, we were working hard with our school districts uh, in both counties. Uh, we had ongoing discussions, and, and again, just so people are aware, this was not a knee-jerk knee reaction. Uh, we have been discussing these plans for many weeks um, around what we are seeing around the world and around the country with cases starting to increase. Uh, a decision was made uh, again on Saturday uh, that we needed to move forward with closing down schools. So we went through, uh, again, through a lot of discussion around uh, making those uh, uh, unprecedented decisions and uh, that's where we are today with those so we are in a, a local state of emergency in both counties and that will be in place for a minimum of 30 days and it will be reevaluated as we move forward uh, we do want to encourage our parents um, you know to communicate with their local schools there's a lot of information that's going out through their robocalls and other ways they're sending out information uh, so we want you to check with your local school districts. Uh, they are all doing a, a little different uh, approach to how they're dealing with things. A lot of them are standing up and providing meals, breakfast, lunch, et cetera. Because uh, again, we want to try to make sure we're helping folks with those wraparound ancillary services that they need during this time. So make sure you're checking your school's websites. Pay attention closely to the information that they're pushing out. Uh, that is being done individually by them. Uh, obviously, uh, late breaking news today, uh, the governor obviously did uh, some new changes to protocols and as of 8 o'clock tonight, restaurants, bars, gyms, movie theaters, casinos are all closed to the public. Um, restaurants, etc., are going to be uh, open to carry out and take out. So again, uh, restaurants are in, in planning. I know we've heard from several of them today about that process. Uh, so again, uh, if you have concerns, call ahead, see if they can uh, you know, service you and figure out what um, they can do to provide you food during this time. Um, we're going to continue to provide updates on our websites in both counties uh, with new information, again, that uh, is trusted and factual. So we want to uh, definitely send folks there as uh, best we can. Uh, we want to encourage all those that are experiencing respiratory illness and symptoms to call their primary care provider first. The last thing we want to have happen is folks that are symptomatic, again with respiratory issues, is to go to their provider's office into their waiting room with other sick folks. Uh, we really want to make sure that they're calling ahead. Uh, do not go to the urgent cares, do not go to the emergency rooms if you have mild symptoms uh, relative to respiratory issues. Uh, I would like to remind folks, and we've been talking about this in a lot of our uh, press releases, 
Influenza is still very widespread and prevalent in our communities. We still have 20 to 30 to 40 cases per week occurring in Genesee and Orleans County. More than likely, if you're having respiratory illness at this moment, it's going to be influenza or some other respiratory illness. There is no evidence of widespread community uh, spread of COVID-19 at the moment. Um, we're not going to stand up here and say that there is not cases. Uh, we just have not identified them yet. But more than likely, the experience that you're having is from another respiratory illness. So we want to make sure, again, you are calling ahead. Do not flood our health care systems with uh, you know, the, the, the walking well and those that are um, uh, concerned. We need to make sure that they are kept clear and kept clean for those that actually need that level of care. Um, we do have a hotline. We've been uh, putting that number up consistently. Uh, this is sponsored by the state. It's 24-7. Um, and the number is 1-888-364-3065. And again, that's provided in your information. We want folks to call that number if you have general questions about COVID-19, about some of the guidance and the restrictions that are in place. Call that first. They will hopefully be able to provide you with the information you have. Um, if you're feeling stressed out, um, if you're overly anxious and you, need, and you need someone to talk to from the mental health side of things, we do have a care and crisis helpline that covers both Genesee and Orleans counties. Um, again, that number is listed there, 585-283-5200. Uh, again, 585-283-5200. And we would encourage you to call that number if, if you're dealing with some uh, mental health issues and you need to talk to someone. Uh, talk to someone. Again, that is available. There is also a text line that's available, 741741. Um, so again, uh, this is a, a rapidly evolving situation. Uh, we are currently working uh, in the background and logistically to set up our drive-through swabbing locations. Again, you may have seen some of these uh, setups downstate and across the country where, again, we want folks to go to once the, uh, the swabbing becomes readily available in our communities. Not going to the doctor's offices again, not going to the healthcare systems, but going to these locations when they stand up if you're symptomatic. Again, based on your screening, with the limited availability of swabbing kits, we are screening. We're looking to protect and to test our most vulnerable populations. Again, that is our senior population, and that is uh, those with immune compromised uh, health issues. So if you fit those uh, categories and you're having respiratory issues, those are the people that we're going to put priority when we do our swabbing. And again, this is starting to slowly ramp up. It, be, it shall become more uh, available as we move along. But until that time happens, we're going to be screening and, and prioritizing and triaging to that, to that effect. So again, if, you, if you're sick, stay home. We don't want you out in the community. We don't want you out at your workplace. We don't want you going around and, and spreading that. So stay home. That's the best thing you can do. Uh, make sure, again, these common uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, NPIs, washing your hands frequently. It's very important that we're doing that continually. Uh, making sure that we're practicing social distancing. Obviously, the, the different directives and uh, things that the um, uh, state has put in place are extreme by a lot of measures to a lot of folks. But we need to be doing this in order to quell and to you know, suppress the spread of this in our community. Um, we, a lot of these measures are pre preemptive, all right? We do not have a confirmed case. But the best time to implement these type of measures is before we have a case. Once we have a case, we know for a fact that that is already starting to spread around and we're going to be behind the eight ball. So the best thing we can do now is spread out and practice the social distancing, listen to the guidance that is from our folks around here that we're putting out in our press releases. It's very important that you um, stay consistent and, and you adhere to those guidelines, even if they seem extreme and un unnecessary. In order for us to combat this together locally, we need to do this together. It's an all-in effort. And I know that together, working collaboratively, if we, if we all comply and we work towards uh, meeting the end of this, then we'll get there. Um, there. There's no doubt in my mind we can weather this storm together. So um, with that, uh, I don't know if anybody else has any comments. We've got two things okay. before we get to questions. Mike Cianfrini and the city manager would also like to make two very specific okay. remarks. And then unless EMS has something else, then we open it up to questions. Sounds so, good. So Michael. Okay. Thank you. I just very briefly want to update uh, everyone on the status of the county clerk's office and specifically the motor vehicle office. Um, the situation we've got in the motor vehicle office is we are very short staffed as it is. Uh, and in light of the COVID-19 crisis that we have right now, we found today that we had only two cashiers and one trainee uh, were the only ones we had available to run windows. Um, so an already short staffed office uh, has seen the problem exacerbated quite a bit. Uh, what we found today was that 
the volume of traffic that we had in the DMV far exceeded what any uh, reasonable uh, health care professional would, seem, would deem reasonable. Um, we had lines out the doors today. We had a lobby full of people from the minute that we opened the doors until the time I left to come over to this conference. Uh, this goes against every, every bit of advice that we've had with regard to social distancing. Um, it exposes my staff and everyone in the office to any contagion that the public might bring in. What we're finding is that with a lot of the counties around us going to uh, appointment only or closing completely, we're getting a, a large volume of traffic coming in from out of the county to, to come to our DMV. So in light of that, commencing tomorrow, uh, March 17th, our DMV will only allow uh, less than 10 people in the lobby at any one time. So. Uh, if we get more than that, they are going to have to wait outside of the motor vehicle office. Uh, the sheriff has uh, indicated that he's going to have a deputy there to assist us with monitoring that. And potentially the wait times could be very long. Uh, I'm not sure what our staffing level is going to be for tomorrow, but if the volume of traffic is anything like it was today, the wait could be significant. So what we're asking the public to do is, to the extent possible, don't come to the DMV unless absolutely necessary. We will not be able to do any enforcement transactions. If you have a registration uh, renewal, we ask please just put it in an envelope and drop it in the drop box right outside of the DMV on Court Street. It will be processed, it will be mailed back to you as quickly as we can get to it, which will probably be within a day or two. Um, unless absolutely necessary, uh, don't come into the office. We, we usually don't say this. We ask people to come into the offices to do their transactions locally so that we keep the revenue in the county. Uh, but in light of this COVID-19 crisis, if you're able to do anything on the state DMV website, we ask that you do that. Um, the primary concern for me, while we want to serve the public, my concern is the safety and health of my staff. And anything that jeopardizes that, we're going to have to take action. So as the situation develops, we may have to implement more policies. But as it stands right now, starting tomorrow, we will be allowing uh, less than 10 only in the DMV. Martin. Good afternoon, and thank you to the county for letting us give a couple of updates here. The, the city of Batavia is taking a very good and measured approach to the, the COVID-19 or coronavirus, whichever one you want to call it. We give our thanks to the employees here at the city of Batavia who are taking all due caution and making sure the counters are wiped down, that we keep our proper, as this new term has come up, social distancing. Um, but there are some specific things. One of them specifically that is new, the city clerk's office uh, after this afternoon will be closed for the short-term foreseeable future and please take note of that there will still be able to have transactions employees will be coming to the to work they will be providing information over the phone or online responding in in those manners and a number of things can be done in those methods to be able to take care of what you need to take care of but we have had some instances most people are very good about actually stepping up and, and if, they're not, if they're not feeling that well, not coming in. But we have had a few instances of people, or one or two at least, that I've heard personally coming in, coughing, hacking, and out of caution for the employees here at the city clerk's office, we're asking, we're telling you the door will be locked if you try to walk into that door. Uh, the, the public works office will be, you need to call ahead and let them know you're coming. Please make sure you don't have any issues and check in with them if there's something dealing with building permits and those type of things. In relationship to the city manager's office, my assistant city manager, I didn't have a chance to brief her, but we are gonna be asking appointment only, please uh, call ahead. We, that way we can help control some of that because we do get some traffic from the public in and out of, in and out of there occasionally. Also, I did want to remind you of some other areas in the city that have already been noticed out in the press. One of them is the police department. Uh, the police department doors, as you walk in, you'll probably notice they're locked. And if you try to call in, they will let you know what, what method of communication you can do. I think they would like you to call. There's, they do have a dispatch number. If there's an issue and you can't get a hold of 911, please do call 911 if you have an issue or a legitimate emergency. I did also want to clarify for anyone who was wondering that yes, the police are available to answer calls.
for service if they are related to a, an incident in progress, such as a crime and those type of things. If it's not a specific incident in service, they may call you back and say, okay, what do you have? What is your concern? And if it looks like they need to come out, they'll make that judgment call. If not, uh, they'll work with you with the other uh, means of technology and things that we have to be able to help you out. The final thing is to let you know, those of you who are hockey fans may be a little bit disappointed, but the uh, Folletti Ice Arena, we spoke with the management over there and they will be closing. In fact, as, as of today, they're closing for the foreseeable future. Uh, you can go ahead and call over to them and ask them what they're thinking about, but in relationship to dealing with these gatherings and getting people together, um, they felt and we felt in talking with our public works director that it's better for that to stay closed for right now. One other thing, and following up with what Martin just said about city facilities, the county two parks in Bethany and in DeWitt are both closed officially as far as events, reservations, and the pavilions that are there. The parks themselves, if you wish to walk or run around them, uh, those will still be accessible in that regard, but for nothing else that draws a group, nor is any part of our reservation system or the normal way in which the county parks, uh, those two county parks operate. So you will find the gates locked um, as far as at both facilities where going into the interior of the park is not going to be an option going forward. As Paul indicated, all of what we're trying to do here is coordinated between two county governments. The consistency on the two websites, as far as county health departments, um, is exactly the same. Obviously, in terms of certain details, as Paul indicated, that will also be modified for each of those counties. The city of Batavia and we are in lockstep also with regard to public health, but also in terms of the law enforcement, first responders, um, the fire departments, uh, also as far as information we're trying to give out, and also dealing with, as Paul mentioned, the fact that circumstances for us in the public sector are changing literally on the hour if not every 10 minutes and that also in deals with the most recent directive that came from the executive office with regard to our own workforce so we are both working on plans as to how we will try to adhere to that directive but we also have to put plans together and deal with the individuals who we are charged with and responsibility and responsible for making sure our county workforce and our operations have some semblance of continuity going forward but that is very much a work in progress uh, and literally as I indicated could change based on whatever the governor does or doesn't say anytime during his press conferences or as he's also dealing with issues dealing with the state budget and all of us as part of the local government uh, response sector so either Tim or, or Dale anything else yeah just 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 quickly um, you know our our mission is to maintain public safety so that's uh, making sure that law enforcement fire and EMS systems still maintain themselves uh, our concern as well is supporting the health care system uh, throughout the county, not just the hospital, but any of the health care systems throughout the county, both in Orleans and in Genesee County. So we do ask and echo some of the comments made here. You, the, the services need to be maintained. You may see some tempered responses, some different responses by law enforcement and EMS. You may see some things that we're doing a little bit differently that we haven't done in the past, but it's imperative that we maintain public safety for the residents of Genesee and Orleans County. Uh, we do ask again, as, we, as just has been mentioned, uh, we prefer, obviously, we hold emergencies to 911. If it's not an emergency, please do not use the 911 system. It is going to tax, uh, tax, tax, and te text our system out to the to the point of uh, really stretching it thin. So, if it's not a true emergency, pick up the phone, call your primary care physician, call the hotline, and get the information you need. And um, we'll do the very, very best that we can. We're currently day-to-day, uh, hour-to-hour, minute-to-minute. We're fulfilling requests from uh, public safety uh, and health care agencies to ensure that those supplies are replenished uh, and maintained. The other thing is that from now on until the foreseeable future, we will be doing this at 4 o'clock here in this building going forward until such time as either serious situations change or by some magic or miracle sometime in the next 30 to 60 days, COVID-19 is no longer uh, the top health care issue of New York State and the nation it itself. So, questions? Michael, and please stand up and address who you're talking to. Speak up, Mike, please. Every day. It, it may not be on the weekends. It depends if there's actually information. But the five weekdays, definitely, possibly, uh, if, if need be, also on the weekends. So you're going to have an update here every day, Monday through Friday, Correct. 
Correct. Um, Paul, yep. uh, please announce, please. Speak up. Paul, uh, Brian from the Placidia uh, Daily News. Yep. I, um, in, in, your, in your discussions with the schools, have they, is there anything more to add about uh, any concerns they may have uh, about when they, when, they, when they want to work? Yeah, so we've again been in discussion with all the school districts throughout this entire time, obviously, and the way we uh, wrote up the orders and they closed down, it was uh, for an indeterminate amount of time, obviously, until further notice. Uh, and, and the goal there was that we can uh, evaluate that weekly. So there is not a defined or a determined time period that we will be uh, opening them back up. Uh, we need to really assess what's going on on the ground. I know some, some counties and some other places have done for a two-week period. Uh, the, the reality is we don't want to go through this opening and closing, opening and closing situation. It really uh, minimizes the, uh, the impact and the effect that, again, the social distancing and mitigation strategy will do. Uh, so we will be evaluating this uh, weekly and ongoing. And again, information will be coming out real time um, if, if schools are to the point where we're able to start ramping up and opening them back up. And to that end, they are putting information on their websites literally yep. um, as they are putting plans together and what their contingencies are, as, as uh, was indicated by serving meals to the students. Not necessarily bringing them in, but having them drive by and literally pick up meals, at least in two of the districts here in Genesee County. Bob, yep. Dan Fisher from WBTN. Question is not locally focused, but one of the sure. things that we're hearing an awful lot is what is different about COVID-19 that has prompted the reaction and the response that other viruses over the last 10 to 15 years have not? That's a great question, and uh, you know, obviously, it, it, there's new information coming out all the time. Obviously, there's a lot of research and studying going into this virus, particularly. Um, I, I will say, from what we do know now, uh, that from from what the evidence we again have seen from the onset in China and through, and the cases that we have had, uh, that it is uh, disproportionately affecting some of again our seniors and our uh, immune compromised folks. Uh, if you look at the death rate of uh, seasonal influenza, uh, it's at about 0.01 percent. Um, you know, so it's, it's, it's a small percentage of, of folks that actually are passing from, uh, you know, influenza. Uh, and if you look at COVID-19, it's 10 times that. And again, that's a general number. If you look at some of the, the locations where COVID-19 has been hardest hitting in China and uh, Wuhan and some of those other provinces, the death rate is 3 to 5 percent in some estimates. So again, when we look at the severity and the death rate, uh, that is really something that, that, that makes us uh, nervous on the, on the health care and the public health side, that this uh, can have a significant impact, expect, especially to those at-risk populations we really want to protect uh, during this. So, again, there, there's a lot unknown about it. I mean, we're hearing different things about how long it could stay in the air, potentially up to three hours, again, airborne. Uh, which isn't necessarily the same with all viruses. How long it can live on surfaces, which is why we're really encouraging folks to do enhanced cleaning over and over and over again. It's important to wipe these surfaces down, these common doorknobs, these areas where people are going in and out. Um, those, those are some of the, the concerns of why we're taking these unprecedented uh, steps uh, across the country to try to suppress this. Uh, again, if you look at some other examples internationally, there's been different responses. Uh, South Korea took a more aggressive response in shutting things down. Their growth uh, factor in the number of cases is not as steep as what you saw potentially here in Italy recently, where it was a lot steeper of a curve. And the goal here through social mitigation and these extreme unprecedented measures is, again, you've probably heard this, flatten the curve. You flatten the curve. You hear this from all over the place. And the idea is that we want to push out the number of cases. We're not going to stop them. We know there will be spread, but we want to slow it down so that we don't have a steep spike in cases that's going to overwhelm our health care system. And currently, as I mentioned earlier, we are still uh, dealing with prevalent flu in our communities. Our health care systems are still dealing with that. They don't have the beds and they don't have the capacity. So the goal here is to slow it down, to try to uh, keep, the, again, the cases from uh, going up such a steep spike, right? And we can push that out over time so that we can now hopefully get out of our traditional flu season and have the capacity to deal with the illnesses from COVID-19. Going to be 
Yeah, so as, as I mentioned, we do not have any test kits as I speak right now in the health departments. Uh, we do know that there are some local providers, again, that are able to potentially get some of those kits through their uh, health care systems and their affiliations with their uh, the groups. I, I know uh, UMMC does have some uh, swabbing kits available. Um, we do have some that we're hopefully going to be getting tomorrow for limited um, uh, swabbing. But that is an evolving, uh, evolving scenario. As we get more kits, it will become more readily available, which is why we're encouraging folks to call their primary care physician so that they can be screened to see if they're uh, one of the appropriate folks that we would want to uh, swab for COVID-19, again, based on the, the screening criteria and the risk factors. Um, but again, at some point, probably later this week, we'll be coming and talking a little bit more about some of these drive-through drive swabbing locations and how uh, best to uh, relay the information to our residents and how they can uh, interact and utilize those stations. So how soon will you be able to get um, some of those testing kits here? So you want to have a date? Well, uh, again, so we will have more kits tomorrow on the health department side, but there are more kits we are hearing from community providers. And again, uh, we, we're losing our ability on the public health side to fully understand you know, the testing and the, the swabbing that's going on. Because once providers um, have the kits, they can order the, the test just, or the swab just like they do for any illness, right? Uh, they're going to go to their private labs or their health systems labs to be tested. So we're going to be responding to positive cases at that point when we get notified and isolating those folks when we uh, identify them and doing contact tracing back to those exposures. And Paul, with regard to the testing, what kind of turnaround have you experienced so far with kits that have been sent to a certified? Yeah, company? so that, that's uh, it's been a challenge. Uh, Wadsworth uh, State Lab has was the uh, initial lab online for New York State, and uh, the turnaround time was varying between two to four days because they were really getting swamped with what was happening downstate, and they were the only ones running them uh, in New York State. And then slowly since then, other labs have come online. Uh, locally, uh, Erie County Public Health Lab is the one that we're utilizing, but we're also also hearing from some of our health systems that uh, they are now doing uh, the testing uh, in Rochester at URMC and Rochester Regional. Uh, and I know there's other labs coming on all the time. So the, um, the uh, ability uh, to test in that time turnaround will hopefully really shorten. Uh, pretty much when we get the uh, test kits to Erie County by 11 o'clock in the morning, uh, they're, they're able to turn around that result so we can have that later in the day. Yeah, so, so the goal is to try to put those uh, updates as far as the numbers you're talking about. Yeah, to have those up there hopefully by 5 o'clock every day with the newest numbers. And again, you, you, uh, you got to keep in mind that's a continually rolling clock so, and rolling numbers. So we're trying to at least put up once a day a snapshot in time of what we have in both counties. Yep. Is, is there anything that you can specify about where the other uh, uh, drive, drive up testing sites will be? Yeah, n not at this time. Uh, emergency management is working with our staff and, and looking at uh, some different locations in the county. Um, obviously, we got to vet them and make sure that they're suitable to handle uh, the traffic flow that would be coming in potentially for swabbing. So we really want to make sure that uh, we've identified locations that, number one, are going to keep folks safe, right, and make sure that they're locations that are suitable for cars and suitable to, to protect uh, not only our workforce as they do these uh, swabs in, in the field, so to speak, but also, uh, you know, the facility and the grounds and all the personnel. So uh, we will have more about those locations uh, soon within the next couple of days. Well, so again, I, I can't, yeah, so I have no verification that that is the case. Um, obviously, there are rumors and things you hear. Um, you know, again, as this thing uh, changes minute by minute, literally, we, we don't know. We may, we may find out about that tonight or tomorrow. Um, again, that's not, nothing, it's, and it's not anything we can comment on locally. I mean, obviously, we're reacting to those situations. But again, as we said earlier, I would encourage all of our residents to be prepared to take precautions to plan ahead and to prepare for those type of things. Uh, you know, one issue that obviously we've been really dealing with locally, as everybody has, is the shortages in our supermarkets and trying to get basic commodities that we all need. And I, I really want to reach out to our residents and, and tell them, look, I understand the knee-jerk reaction and the, uh, the, the fear factor of needing to hoard and get these things, but we're getting uh, uh, real-time concerns by mothers, by those that need um, baby formula, they need baby wipes, and they cannot get them, right? So we want to make sure that we're really encouraging folks to, to think of others while you're thinking of yourself.
all right? So you don't necessarily need to hoard uh, toilet paper for six months or a year. Um, you know, let's think of others, make sure that we share it around. And, you know, again, we can weather this storm for, uh, uh, you know, two weeks, a month, two, two months, whatever it may be, but we need to do it in a rational and a collaborative way working together. Yeah, so uh, I'll give you the high-level response to that because I could really get in the weeds and, and kind of geek you out here with some of the nuances of epidemiology. What's that? That's right. Um, but, uh, you know, the reality is what happens is we uh, start doing uh, uh, case contacting. So we're going to send our public health folks out. We're going to talk to that confirmed case. Where have they been? Who have they been in contact with? We're going to call them up. We're going to verify. We're going to try to identify those case contacts and then put them under that uh, mandatory quarantine because, again, they had, a, they had a confirmed contact with a confirmed COVID-19 case. So really that, that's what's happening. If you look around Monroe County, for example, now with the case that we found out about on Saturday, uh, I believe last I heard there was over 100 people in quarantine. If you look downstate at Westchester, they had over 1,000 people in quarantine from the cases that they had down there. So again, the idea is to really try to understand, you know, who is in contact with these folks and try to contain it. Um, again, there's different strategies when it comes to pandemics and dealing with outbreaks. There's a containment component, again, trying to identify who has uh, the disease, trying to encircle that and keep it from spreading. And then there's the community mitigation side. So we're in this hybrid moment where we're still doing containment. We're still trying to identify and try to suppress it that way. But we're also doing extreme measures here through social distancing, again, trying to keep folks apart from one another. So it's kind of a hybrid approach right now, but essentially, if there is a confirmed case, we would be contacting and doing that case investigation and, and potentially quarantining folks based on that exposure. So, so again, you got to look at the definition of exposure. Uh, it's, six, it's within six feet for a prolonged period, uh, period of time. It's somehow exposure to you know, the virus, so not necessarily. Um, that's something we would have to do through, through discussion and looking at it. Um, again, there's some unknowns, as we've talked about, with this virus. Um, so that's why it's important, again, to keep folks apart. It's counterintuitive to some extent. We're all sitting here uh, like this because uh, we could all be in quarantine, I suppose, um, if it came down to that. But, you know, the reality is we still need to figure out a way to go about our, our daily lives in as much of a normal sense as possible. Um, we just need to do it in a very cautious and preventative way. Yeah. I, by the way, I turned my device off. Thank you. Sorry? I said I turned my device off. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, sir. I, I have now done that. Uh, obviously, the number one concern here, I think, from everyone is the, is the public health. But at some point, there is an economic impact to all of this. As a county manager, does that concern you? A, B, have you ever seen in your career, which is now some 27 years, 45 total, because I can relate to an experience elsewhere. Go ahead. <laughs> but I'm also one of the target population. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, it, it, yeah, and to that regard, obviously, it's, it's across the entire state of New York. We are obviously major uh, beneficiaries of what we do with our local sales tax and what the state generates as far as their budget is concerned. Obviously, there's a lot of stuff that's in play as far as that's concerned. The fact that many of the local facilities that are part of our sales tax stream are not going to be operating on their normal basis going forward, um, but the number R is something that obviously, as far as we're concerned, we will, and our, the person who gets all that detailed information um, is the county treasurer with regard to results he's seeing with each of the shares that we get and that get distributed to others in the community. And certainly, even in terms of immediate response and what we're going to be tracking, just as if in any other natural disaster with FEMA, with the state of New York, also keeping track of our expenses and what hopefully, in some cases, will be a reimbursement for county governments and city governments and town and villages with regard to specific COVID-19 responses and, and activity because that's part of what the state and potentially the federal aid will be addressing. But certainly anything with, with that being our second, our largest, second largest revenue stream in the Genesee County budget, 
Obviously, sales tax is a major concern to us as to what is or is not functioning, what's going on as far as normal business activity that is sales taxable. But again, a lot of this is totally out of our control. As Paul indicated, and as we're seeing even literally today, uh, the information coming from the state um, is very much one-sided and certainly wasn't shared. You folks, even in the media, got information about the, the uh, essential versus non-essential before even the governments and the local governments throughout the county uh, knew that this was even in play as he was having a press conference this morning at 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, uh, providers this evening at 7 o'clock, uh, and that's for the, the agency uh, leadership. So they, they're, they're treating this, they, they, they're always exposed, right, to, to viruses and sicknesses and things of that nature. So they always should be taking the proper precautions. So it's really nothing different. Um, we're just replenishing and making sure that they have everything they do need and then replenishing what they, they have to have uh, as far as PPE or personal protective equipment. Same okay. Thing. We, uh, uh, thank you. We need to repair downstairs for the rest of this because we have other business we have to conduct that isn't going to be in this room. So, anybody who wants to keep following up, we're going right downstairs. Thank you. Thank you.